Well, let me say, first of all, uh, just as, as a, uh, a, a point of policy, if the United States uh, government uh, said um, we need a two-state solution and we need it now, it needs to be the uh, object of whatever actions are taken, first of all, the United States would find itself in partnership with all of the rest of the world with the single exception, I would say, single exception of the Netanyahu government. And uh, the Netanyahu government uh, does not speak for the interests of the Israeli people, nor, I think, for the Israeli people at all right now. But the point is, if the United States followed through on the logic of what Biden and Blinken have said in recent days, they would find that the United States is part of a complete global consensus. That global consensus would effectively be exercised very uh, directly and institutionally in the UN Security Council, where there would be immediately a unanimous vote for a ceasefire based on moving to a two-state solution. And just so every listener understands <coughs> uh, correctly my own thought about this, that that move to a two-state solution would include intrinsically the demilitarization, disarming, demobilization of all of the violent militias, including Hamas, and there are several others as well, which have backers throughout the Middle East. So the first thing is that it would be possible for the U.S., to find a, a unanimity uh, other than Israel in the uh, rest of uh, the United Nations member states. Uh, it would be possible to find a full agreement on this with the Arab and Islamic leaders. And this is not a hunch on my part. One needs merely to look at the statement that the Arab and Islamic leaders made from their emergency meeting in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, a couple of days ago. They didn't call for the destruction of Israel. They didn't wail uh, about uh, the evils. They said this needs a political solution now to save the lives of the people of Palestine, but also for the security of Israel. Israel. In other words, for everybody's security, this war needs to stop immediately and we need a two-state solution. And in that statement by the Arab and Islamic leaders, they pointed out a document which is absolutely important and fascinating for people to refresh their memories or to learn about for the first time if they don't know about it, and that is the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative also spearheaded by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And what in 2002 the Arab leaders said is, we will normalize relations with Israel. We will have diplomatic relations. We will end the state of war with the achievement of a state of Palestine in a two-state solution. We will help to guarantee the security of Israel. One of the great lies of our time is there's no one to talk to. Uh, that's what uh, Netanyahu and his cronies say. The ones to talk to are Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, and indeed, by the way, Iran as well, which is actively engaged in constructive diplomacy that we have blown off repeatedly, including the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, which was the deal uh, in 2015 with Iran uh, to uh, end sanctions uh, as part of uh, the uh, disbandment uh, by Iran of any nuclear program. And then Trump walked away from that, and Biden never walked back to it. All of this is to say there's plenty of grounds, plenty of grounds for constructive diplomacy right now for Israel's security. So why doesn't it happen? Because the Netanyahu government doesn't 
want it to happen because that constructive security is constructive towards a Palestinian but, but, but what state. But what about the Biden government? Like, I don't see any signs that the Biden administration is using its massive leverage over Israel as the primary sponsor of Tel Aviv. Why Not isn't it? Why isn't it? You know, we can't know for sure, uh, but I would say my best guess uh, is uh, that uh, senior politicians of Biden's generation, okay, this is the septuagenarian and octogenarian generation, <laughs> are trained by instinct never show a glimmer of space between yourself and Israel because you will feel a backlash. And I think that it is just political instinct. Uh, you know, that's basically what Biden rides on these days anyway, is uh, whatever instinctual uh, motives uh, or urges uh, come to him. But I think it's basically that they believe don't show any space with Israel. That's the prudent measure for an American politician. By the way, it's completely wrong. It's so out of date. Uh, but we're seeing that sense of being out of date everywhere. We're seeing it on the campuses as well, where the older generation is pro-Israel and can't understand anything but complete pro-Israel sentiment. And the students are saying, oh, we're watching this mess slaughter taking place in Gaza. This is not right. And so there's a generational divide on the campuses. There's a generational divide in uh, the broader population. There's a generational divide among the voters. But my guess is that this is instinct and uh, out of date uh, spin doctors uh, in the White House uh, telling Biden, you've got to do it this way. And this is not a strong president. And it's an extraordinarily weak foreign policy team. They've gotten everything wrong. Remember, it's Jake Sullivan who said two weeks before October 7 that the Middle East is the quietest that it's been in 20 years. And actually, in that article in Foreign Affairs, specifically said that the tensions in Gaza have been wound down. So this is a group that's out of touch, not competent, and I think uh, just relying on what were the instincts of American politicians for decades, which is back Israel to the hilt no matter what. But now it has literally isolated the United States, so it's 191 against two, and it's not in America's interest. But by the way, I think people listening should understand this is not in Israel's interest. I'm not saying a word against Israel's interest. Israel is being damaged so severely by this miserable person, Netanyahu, uh, who should be in prison, by the way, because he's also corrupt on top of uh, being miserable in so many other ways. But it, it, Israel is being incredibly endangered by the wrong-headed approach that Israel's taking. Yeah, we're about to talk to Michael Tracy, who's spent the last several weeks traveling throughout Israel, and there's a lot of critics of Netanyahu, and there's a lot of critics of the Israeli war effort, even more so, I think, in Israel than people, at least in the elite class in the United States, feel comfortable expressing. I want to ask you about Ukraine, but before I do, you mentioned college campuses. College campuses. There has been a huge amount of focus over the last several years by the American pundit class, political class, on college campuses. I think a lot of people couldn't figure out why. I think you put your finger on one of the reasons, which is that there are some doctrines developing there that the American elite, on a bipartisan level, have never accepted in fear and dislike, one of which is this questioning of why we're so blindly supportive of Israel. And there's been this massive focus on college students since the outbreak of this war, trying to have billionaires compile a list of students who should be put on no higher blacklists because they signed petitions that were insufficiently supportive of Israel or overly critical of Israel. We've had efforts to pressure faculty to stop allowing pro-Palestinian protests from mega donors who are telling these schools we're going to withhold funding in the event that you don't change your policy or that you don't institutionally defend Israel. One of the centerpieces of that controversy is Harvard. I just had uh, Professor Walt of my show, uh, Stephen Walt, who talked about the situation at Harvard, but the other institution that often gets focused on with this issue is Columbia, which is where you're at. Talk to me a little bit about 
the concerns you have about the climate being the focus on American academic campuses, on the potential chilling effect. We interviewed some Harvard students who were put on those no hire lists for having signed this uh, statement. They're having trucks riding around the Harvard campus with their face on it, a megaphone blaring that they hate Jews and are anti-Semitic. Imagine the kind of harassment that brings. What has been your sense of what's happening on the Columbia campus? Look, I think there's one thing that universities should be doing right now, uh, and that is having discussions, sessions, lectures, teach-ins about history, about this conflict, uh, about uh, what is really happening, uh, not only uh, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, but I would say Ukraine as well. The students are a absolutely uh, unnerved and upset by a world of war. And uh, one of the responsibilities of the university is to discuss these issues not to clamp down, for God's sake, not to say this is impermissible, but actually to teach, to learn, to discuss, to analyze together. There's not enough of that going on by a long shot. Uh, and this is uh, quite uh, disturbing because uh, the universities are, should be thinking institutions uh, they are institutions of diverse views. They should be in places of vigorous open debate, but especially honest and open inquiry. Columbia has uh, the greatest uh, historian uh, of uh, modern Palestine, Rashid Khalidi. Uh, he's brilliant. His books are, are uh, magnificent books about uh, the history and the plight of Palestine. Uh, during the last century. Uh, students need to, to read those, to understand, to listen to Professor Khalidi and others, uh, to have an open discussion of all of this. Uh, instead, of course, uh, you know, we've, we've had uh, not uh, that kind of educational experience. We've had confrontation, donors yelling, threatening to withhold their funds if you don't crack down on this and that, the doxing uh, it, it's it's horrible. I mean, this is so bad for American society to have that approach rather than saying, my God, you know, this is very serious. Let's understand this. Uh, and, of course, we're not really in an understanding mood on so many things in this country. Uh, when, when we talked about uh, Ukraine, there was a lot to understand. That was one of the things I've seen uh, close up for 30 years because I was – involved as an advisor to Gorbachev, to Yeltsin, to Kuchma uh, in Ukraine uh, more than 30 years ago. And I wanted people to understand the background. What's the history? Read about this. Understand it. Debate it. But, uh, of course, everything got nailed down. If you say one word that isn't uh, completely in line with uh, beating Russia, you're a Putin lover. You know, everything was to shut down debate and understanding rather than to discuss, understand, and analyze. And we're not serving our national interest, our social interest, our university's interest or capacity if we approach it that way. So it's, it's, it's not good. Absolutely. So let me ask you this is my final question about Ukraine. Uh, those of us who are Kremlin agents, who are official uh, Russian apologists on various lists and stuff. There Got we go. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're having a little confederation of, of, of Putin apologists on the show. We have another one coming up. Um, got put there because for months we were saying, look, it seems like the U.S. fueling of this war is actually making things a lot worse. That It doesn't seem like Ukraine will be able to win. Russia is a much larger country. The front line hasn't moved in a year. There have been tens of thousands of young Ukrainian conscripts and Russian soldiers as well who are losing their lives over the kind of inch-by-inch -inch trench warfare that came to dominate World War I. And at the end of the day, there's no way Ukraine can expel Russia from that territory for all sorts of reasons. It should have been handled at the domestic at the diplomatic table way early on. The Americans obviously didn't want that. And now here we are 18 months later with a new war, having spent over $100 billion, I think, 
even Washington and intelligence agencies throughout the West that were so gung-ho about Ukrainian victory are now finally coming to face the music that the Russians and the, that the Ukrainians are going to have to sit down and part of that negotiation, whether you hate it or not, is going to be a ceding of some portion of Ukrainian territory to the Russians beyond the Crimean Peninsula that they already had control of since 2014. Looking back now on everything that has happened and where we are, what do you make of the last year of enormous amounts of loss of life and just the burning of huge amounts of resources on a war that really hasn't moved in over a year? Well, I think, uh, of course, this is uh, another massive, massive U.S. foreign policy disaster. Uh, right at the beginning, I wrote a, a piece called uh, the, the Latest Neocon Debacle, because the way that this has played out was completely foreseeable from the start, that this was going to go very badly. And not just uh, foreseeable, but predicted by people like you and Professor Mearsheimer yeah. and plenty of people who came through my program predicting with their foreign policy expertise that exactly what has happened would happen. Yeah, I, I would say this one was not very hard to see. Uh, like you said, how could you, be, <laughs> how could you beat Russia? Uh, it, it was uh, pretty obvious. And, uh, you know, these people just are not very clever. Uh, uh, Biden, Newland, Sullivan, uh, Blinken, they've been at this uh, back since uh, 2014. Uh, it, this whole debacle goes back uh, at least to 2008, so we're in the 15th year of this debacle. Arguably, it goes back uh, 30 years, but let's just stay at uh, 2008 for one moment. You know, the point is the U.S. has played a losing hand badly for 15 straight years. And this is really important to understand if one wants to learn a little bit about geopolitical poker, which is we keep raising the stakes on a losing hand because Russia wasn't demanding Ukrainian territory in 2007 and 2008. It was demanding one thing, don't move NATO in. That's all. Perfectly sensible. Our top diplomats like Bill Burns, who was ambassador to Russia, said as much then, wrote the famous Niet means Niet memo uh, that uh, was uh, uh, known to the public through WikiLeaks uh, so that we really knew what they were saying. Uh, but nobody heeded that, of course, in the political class. Then came Newland uh, as the point person for the U.S. Uh, in conspiring in the overthrow of uh, the Yanukovych uh, presidency in Ukraine in February 2014, and his offense was he wanted neutrality. That's all. Russia wasn't demanding territory under uh, Yanukovych. All they wanted, and they got, was a long-term lease of the Sevastopol naval base, the, the Russian naval base since 1783. They got a lease till 2042. But for the United States, this was not good enough. Uh, uh, we needed NATO there. So uh, Newland helped, uh, and friends, and I know a lot of uh, what happened behind the scenes, uh, took out, helped to take out Yanukovych. And then uh, Putin grabbed uh, Crimea. Referendum took Crimea, but still was not demanding uh, anything more than that, not demanding uh, territory, all the... Russia was demanding was don't shell the Russian, ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine, give a measure of autonomy. And that got negotiated in the so-called Minsk 1 and then Minsk 2 agreements. The Minsk 2 agreement was adopted 15 to nothing in the Security Council. Russia wasn't saying we want to own eastern Donbass. Russia was saying enforce an agreement that unanimously was adopted by the U.N. Security Council. Well, that wasn't good enough for the United States. The U.S. told Ukraine, don't worry about it. You don't have to implement that. We know that. We know that in some detail. So up until December 2021, Russia was not demanding more territory. But in December 17, 2021, President Putin put on the table the draft 
U.S.-Russia security arrangements based on two things. One, no NATO enlargement, and second, a negotiation over the placement of U.S. missile systems, especially Aegis missile systems in Eastern Europe, which Russia regarded understandably as a threat to Russia. The United States gave its formal reply in January 2022. We don't have to discuss any of that with you. That was the reply. We don't have to discuss NATO with you. It's none of your business. So even then, till that moment, Russia wasn't demanding uh, any territory. Then came the special military operation. The Russian Duma recognized the independence of Lugansk and Donetsk, didn't annex them, recognized the independence because we had lost the chance of just implementing the Minsk agreements. And then within three days of the start of the special military operation, Zelensky said, you know, no, no, maybe we should negotiate, uh, maybe neutrality. And in March of 2022, Russia and Ukraine negotiated an agreement based around Ukrainian neutrality. So here comes the U.S. with its lousy hand upping the ante again by running over to Kiev and telling them, no, no, you're not going to negotiate that. We're not going to give you any protection on that. So we blew it again. Then over the summer, Russia mobilizes. Uh, in the fall, it annexes uh, the four oblasts, uh, uh, not only Lugansk and Donetsk, but the Zaporizhia and the Kherson district, getting worse and worse for the United States. And then we tell them, don't worry, we got your back. You just launch a, a major counteroffensive. Now, anyone watching at the time knew there was nothing there militarily. But there's our generals uh, strutting out, oh, we're so optimistic, said General Petraeus and others. What was clearly an impossibility. It seems nobody knows for sure in this uh, delusional approach of the government that maybe they thought this uh, coup by uh, Prigozhin uh, was, was the secret weapon. Who knows? But anyway, this was a complete debacle, of course. Uh, Ukraine lost tens of thousands of people in a very short period of time. It lost, again, the armies that had been built up, the uh, military hardware, the tanks, uh, the, uh, uh, all the uh, artillery systems and so forth. Uh, and uh, here we are. They've raised the stakes for 15 years on a losing hand, and they can't get it. And this is... This is our team. They're just, they failed. Biden needs, I mean, Biden, okay. We need a new foreign policy team, and we need a new foreign policy approach, and we need to negotiate before Ukraine is completely destroyed.